Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this Valentine's Day Sunday in February. It's good to have you here as we explore the many faces of love and the ways it shapes our lives through joy and ache, self-discovery, struggle, fulfillment, surprise, and comfort. I'm Douglas Ducharme, the minister with Fairlawn Avenue United Church, and I am co-leading this service with my colleague, the Reverend Gene Ward. The poet E.E. E. Cummings was the son of a Unitarian minister and spoke of having from an early age transcendental leanings, as he put it. He also wrote frequently of love. Being to timelessness as it's to time, love did no more begin than love will end. Where nothing is to breathe, to stroll, to swim, love is the air, the ocean, and the land. Love is the voice under all silences, the hope which has no opposite in fear. The strength so strong mere force is feebleness, the truth more first than sun, more last than star. Music is a huge part of our spirituality at Fairlawn, and today you will find the music of love alongside this worship video. Just scroll down below the link for this video and you will see another link that will take you to the Music Bulletin curated by Eleanor Daly for this Valentine's Sunday. Here are some words of prayer as we ease into worship this day. Wild lover of our souls, O oh God, you do not hold back in your love of us and of all creation. We cannot see you, measure, or contain you, yet we encounter you in mystery and wonder as love. This is how you want to be known. This is who you are. And your love is not abstract. It is healing for our sickness. It is closeness in our loneliness and comfort in our mourning. It's welcome embrace when we are rejected. Your love has walked among us as Jesus whose way in the world was love. Your love stirs us to life. May we feel you holding us as a lover would do, caressing our broken places, knowing us with gentleness and understanding that we may live in the world as signs of love's strength and love's courage. Amen. Our worship co-leader this morning is Jean Ward. The short New Testament book known as 1 John, although referred to as a letter, lacks any of the usual characteristics of personal correspondence, such as an opening or a closing greeting. It is written in a simple style, reflecting a thought process that unfolds gradually, moving at times in circles. At a time of great religious ferment, and competition for followers, the unknown author seeks to help Christians avoid the fake news of that era, false teachers and religious charlatans, by advising them about how to discern true teachers by their ethics, their proclamation of Jesus, and above all, by their love. So hear these words from 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love each other because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only Son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, 
but that God loved us and sent his son. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us, and God's love is made perfect in us. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear, because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters, whom they have seen, can hardly love God, whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from God. Those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. For one human being to love another, the poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote to a young friend, that is perhaps the most difficult of all our tasks, the work for which all other work is but preparation. Waking up each day and choosing to love, that's vulnerability. According to Brené Brown, love will never be certain, but a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all women, men, and children. We're biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong, she says. And so in 1 John, when it says that we know God first and foremost and most completely as love, just that, love, it's kind of awesome. This basic essential claim of faith in the followers of Jesus is that the divine we know and name as God is love. Creative and creating and evolving love laughing and weeping, love, dancing and kneeling, love, vulnerable, risk-taking, love. God is love. Love is who God is. But God's love is not some abstraction. It is passion expressed in action, made tangible and present in Jesus, and in us. In the stories and experiences of how love shapes us, teaches us, wounds us, fulfills us, and expresses the truth of us. Love is rarely effortless. It only looks easy sometimes from the outside. It's an ongoing journey that we are all on. As our society has become more mobile in recent decades, driven by the pressures of fast-paced urban life, the stresses and distractions have increased, and the fabric of love in many of our lives has been stretched and sometimes torn. We needed to discover new skills, new understanding and awareness, to sustain the relationships that give us life, and meaning and a sense of belonging. Now, through this pandemic time, we have had to adapt still further and work in new ways to nurture the loving relationships and connections that keep us whole. So we asked a few Fairlawners to draw on their own rich experience to share something of the learning the resilience, the joy, the challenges, and the hopes that reflect love's many faces. And we sure weren't disappointed. We begin with Carolyn and Greg Clark. Hi, I'm Carolyn Clark. And I'm Greg Clark. And we're here to tell you the story, the love story of Greg and Carolyn Clark. 
it was it was Carolyn's idea, as you can tell, to put it on a flip chart. <laughs> Not. <laughs> We just thought we would take you through our love story uh, and just tell you a little bit about how we started and where we are today. Um, I always like to tell the story that uh, I met both my husbands the same night, uh, second year university at a frat party. And uh, I went home with the MGB and left behind the Volkswagen. <laughs> So I'm the guy with the Volkswagen, and fortunately, history turns out okay because 25 years later we got together. And my part of this part of the story starts with the letter, and this was something that, you, that Carolyn wrote to me in our early dating days. We were geographically undesirable. She was in Mississauga, I was in Toronto, and so we we, we wrote back and forth a lot. Now my letters would be totally illegible and unintelligible. Hers were beautifully written, beautifully scripted, and there was one line in there that I've saved all her letters, and one of them that became our dream, and that was she said, I envision a relationship where we have a lifelong loving relationship of emotional equals. So that became <laughs> the dream. <clears throat> now, it hasn't always been that way, but it gave us a touchstone to always try to try to get to. But we also realized during the, during the relationship that equality is like a teeter-totter. And to think it's always going to be equal ain't right. It's going to be like this and like this. And so what happens over time is you realize this other thing called trust. That if it goes a little bit this way for a while, you trust the other person will bring it back the other way because they love and care for you. And that's what happened as we built trust and went, from, and went towards a loving, respectful relationship. And then, and then, so my next part is our early dating days, which were, which were, um, again, we, we uh, uh, Carolyn was in Mississauga, I was in Toronto, and if you saw our, our calendars from those days, and that's well before smartphones, we had these paper planners, you'd see a little N on one weekend, NK on the next, N then one, NK, and N stood for, or, sorry, it was K and NK. And K stood for a kids weekend, and NK stood for a no kids weekend. Now the kids weekend, we would have good quality time with our kids, and on the no kids weekend, we would party. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, one of my first dates with Carolyn was to take her to a Leaf game, I confess. But we also did things like went to Bermuda, we went to Calgary to go skiing, we went to Montreal, we went to Arizona. You get the idea. We Those had were a lot of fun. fun. Days. So. <laughs> That, so, but it wasn't necessarily great preparation for the next days because then we got married and moved in together and we faced the challenge. The challenge. And the challenge was, well, Greg and I didn't do it the easy way. What, what we did was we started out as uh, friends and um, we went our separate ways. We had two separate families and 25 years later we came back and, uh, well, we waited till they were all six were teenagers. Uh, and then we got together, and that was the challenge. Yeah, it was quite, it was quite a challenge. Uh, we moved in to live together with, with uh, six teenagers in the house and me working in uh, Coburg. Um, and when I, I would introduce Carolyn at, uh, you know, at, 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 at uh, you know, events for ARCs or for other things, and of course you see this gorgeous, beautiful, slim woman here, and mm -hmm. the first question people would ask, how many kids do you have? And I'd say, six, and they'd go, really? <laughs> And I would say, well, let me explain. I'm a venture capitalist, and I have four from startups and two from mergers and acquisitions. Got a laugh anyway at the time. So, so that's uh, so. So that was the challenge. But I, what we like to end off with is letting you know where we are today. And I'd like to say that we have achieved the dream, or at least a lovely, a lovely <laughs> part of that dream. And it um, starts off with uh, we've sort of got four little sub sub bullets under the under the dream. The dream, remember, is a lifelong loving relationship. And the first thing, one of the things we learned was to accept each other as we are. And I got, Carolyn's got a lot of idiosyncrasies. I have one or two, and we've <laughs> learned to accept those from each other and not try to change each other, and that's been wonderful. That has. The other thing that we've done is we've, we feel like newlyweds still. It's, it's been, this is our 20th wedding anniversary this year, but it still feels like we're newlyweds. Um, we still go on dates, we still plan things together, we go on holidays, we have lots of things to look forward to, and each week we set aside a date night 
uh, that we're home. Well, we're home all the time now, aren't we? <laughs> so like one big date. Um, we still have date nights. And we have dinner together and just sort of set aside a night that nothing else interferes and none of the six kids can barge their way in. <laughs> we hope. So, um, and one of the other things, and actually this was pointed out by our daughter Ashley when she was giving advice to one of her friends, which is always kind of neat when your kids use you <coughs> as an example, pardon me. But she wrote a really nice note to her friend, which Carol and I saw, which is, you should do what my parents do. And that is, they do these crazy little things, like I'll write a couple of notes a day to Carol and I call her in the car, give her the road report. She'll leave a little poem for me, I'll buy flowers for her. She, 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 she does something special for me. You get two or three of those in a day and it just reignites the spark and the love and care and attention. So the way that we'd like to finish off is just to say, you know the expression, if you were stuck on a desert island, who would you like to be stuck with? I'd like to be stuck with you. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Ariadne stands in my kitchen, toys amok, mid half-eaten apples and pears, abandoned to the intensity of play. Her dark, sweet eyes, playing no second fiddle to plump fingers and toes, demands of her grandmother accompaniment in the dance. And Nanny then, caught in airy Adney's web, swings her granddaughter round the kitchen floor, surprised by the ache of prayer that follows. Thanksgiving for the child, intercession for her safekeeping, and an angel for her journey. If you have loved a child, your own, a grandchild, a niece or nephew, any child who tugged at your heart and soul at some point in your life. Then you will understand June as she tells us the story of her love for her two daughters. Listen carefully. Love is most often more magical and deep than we can ever imagine. And that passes from one generation to the next. Good morning. For the first 30 years of my life, I never gave motherhood a second thought. I was too busy enjoying childhood, focusing on my education, and catching up on the youthful adventures I had missed spending so much time in the university library. But then I met Alan, and all that changed. I loved him to distraction. I knew that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with him, and suddenly, I was able to look ahead and plan for the future. So then I realized that I wanted to have children, to spend my time and talents, giving them the best start in life that I could, giving them the wonderful home life that I had been blessed with in my childhood and youth. After a bit of trouble, I was able to get pregnant. And as I said to a friend at the time, I knew that motherhood would be fulfilling, but I didn't realize that even carrying my daughter would feel so wonderful. And then Shona arrived. Christopher White once mentioned, there are three words, Hebrew words for love. The love one feels for one's partner and soulmate. The love one feels for the rest of one's family and the love one feels for everyone else in their life. I had understood this as referring to three levels of love. Not so. When I first saw Shona, I loved her with an equal intensity to what I felt for Alan. But it was different, a different type of love. With Alan, there was the admiration of his approach to life, the way he lived his values, I wanted so much to be with him and hopefully to learn from his integrity. But of course, with Shona, there was none of that. There was the feeling that I had to be all things to her. Support her, nurture her, protect her and guide. One of the most important things I wanted for my daughter was to have a sibling. So we were thrilled when Kyla joined the family. The girls got on great throughout their childhood, despite the three and a half years between them. Even now, as they have molded into the different people they were meant to be, 
And even though there is half a world between them, they are very close and keep in touch. Thank goodness for Skype. Another thing that was important to me as a mother was to give my girls a sense of adventure, of courage and confidence that would allow them to go out in the world and explore it to the nth degree. It was great to see the two of them going off on adventures together, supporting and looking out for each other. I tried to give them every opportunity to find things in life that would excite them, reward them and teach them. My girls learned to skate, to ski, to swim, to water ski. They played volleyball and rugby. They played the French horn, the trumpet, the flute, the saxophone, and so much more. We tried to instill in them a love of nature and the great outdoors. That seems to have worked. Of course, I should have known where that would lead. Off they both went to university and never looked back. Maybe there is a touch of genetics in the mix. Since I left home, emigrated in my early 20s, seeking adventure and never went back. Kyla went off to Ottawa for her undergrad and then off to Wales for her masters. She's home now and stuck with her old folks, although I know she would rather have a place of her own. Thank goodness I understand that this is what happens to families. I often think of the old adage, if you love them, you must let them go. From an early age, Shona had known that teaching was her passion. So when she could not get a job teaching grade school in Toronto, she went off to London, England. There she met a guy from New Zealand and the rest, as they say, is history. Last January, we went out to Auckland to see how she was doing. It is great to know that she has landed so well. She has a great partner, a great job, and lives a, in a lovely neighbourhood by the water. Now the circle of life turns. When I wrote this, she was expecting her first child, our first grandchild, a boy. And I really, really wished that I could hug my very pregnant daughter and realize I was hug hugging two generations at once. The baby came yesterday. And now, of course, I wish I could hug them both. But with the pandemic, it will be a long, long time till I can do that. But it's true what they say, love does stretch across the miles. We keep in touch. And I thank the Lord every day for Skype. Jill McAlpine and John Haig have been a part of Fairlawn for about 25 years now. But coming to Fairlawn was a part of a whole new start for their family, for the joys and new discoveries that brought, and for the unexpected that came too, and that they responded to with courage and with love. I'm John Haig. And I'm Jill McAlpine. We try, we're not perfect, but we have been married for 30 years. Now, we, it was suggested to us that we should give a little bit of a background of how Jill and I found each other. And let me assure you, this is not a hot, sizzling office romance, not even close. But we did start together, we're, we're working together at Clarkson Gordon. We're both chartered accountants. We both work in tax planning, John in the international area, and Jill with foundations and charities. What we did have in common, however, is that we both lost our partners. I lost my wife to colon cancer, and Jill went through a divorce. I had a lot of support with family, my network, and they were caring and reaching out to me. But I decided it was appropriate to be a little bit bold, reach out of my comfort zone. So one day at the office, amongst other calls, I awkwardly and a little bit anxiously dialed up Jill McAlpine. And I asked Jill 
whether or not she would join me for lunch. Fortunately, she accepted. We got together, we had lunch, we had a great chat. I explained to Jill that my agenda wasn't hidden, hidden. I was very open and there was no reasons behind it other than I, I wanted to talk to somebody outside of my normal network and ask about how one gets on in their life when you've lost a partner. And we talked about that and Jill was very uh, comforting and, and it was a great conversation. About 30 days later, uh, we had dinner together and uh, that would, we further uh, spoke of, of our, our situations. And before we knew it in the fall, we went to the Consular's Ball in Toronto and found like we both enjoyed dancing. We, in the winter time, we went skiing. We then traveled a little bit. We went on a vacation. Uh, in December 27th, uh, 1990, now that's 30 years ago, um, we got married. We got married at the chapel in St. George's Church. So uh, John's already got us married, but I'm gonna <laughs> uh, go back a little bit and tell you a little bit from my perspective about getting to know John and falling in love with John, because both of those were pretty important before we got to the getting married. And when I reflected on um, what I would say today and getting to know John, um, there's certainly lots of good times, but a consistent theme runs through my memories of important things of getting to know John. And those themes are tough times, um, listening, allowing, accepting, kindness and compassion. So getting to know John, as you know, we did work together. And uh, in fact, John was head of the department that I worked in. And um, he's mentioned that I went through a divorce and I went through a difficult separation um, uh, when I was on maternity leave. Um, and uh, I loved my work and I was getting close to time to go back to work from maternity leave. And I was feeling pretty weak. And so I thought in my wisdom or not that I needed to make it clear to my sort of ultimate boss, the department head, that I'm okay, I'll be there, I'll be there on schedule, and I'm gonna work, but I might not be my best. So I called up John and set up a meeting and had a meeting. I blathered, he listened. I felt better and worse at the same time. Mm -hmm. John's mentioned our dinner date, the night before that dinner date, my dad had a massive heart attack. And um, my family and I were all on vigil, not knowing whether he would survive or not. And I had to call John with my family all nearby. This is a new person in my life. Some of my family, my dad knew John, and I'm trying to call somebody and sort of maybe a date isn't a good thing tonight. It was the most bizarre feeling of um, fear and anxiety and titillation all at the same time. And I called and I said, told John, and as, as he was in, in my uh, meeting at, at separating, uh, he was very kind and compassionate. And he said, you know, if you just wanna slip out of the hospital and leave your vigil for just a short time, that's okay too. We could just have a quick dinner and, and then you can go right back. Um, and so I sort of thought about it. And uh, I think I even ended the call and had to call back and said, you know what, I can do this. I'll, I'll do this. And um, we did meet for dinner. We had a lovely dinner. John brought photographs and carried the entire conversation. I was not the most um, interesting date that night. A few weeks later, John and I uh, took my four-year-old son and we went up to his cottage. We bought a small football with the little thing for the kicker to kick it up at the local home hardware. And my four-year-old son and I and John had a just an amazing day with Jason and John playing football and laughing and Jason sitting on John's knee, drawing pictures and then pinning them up on the cottage. Now, Jill, it's mentioned we brought uh, our family together, and she mentioned Jason. I also uh, brought uh, children into our marriage. 
uh, Carolyn, Dawn, and Colleen. And a couple of years later, uh, on Christmas Eve, Jessica was born. And Jessica and Jill came home from the hospital on Christmas Day. And Jessica was a, a, a bond of bringing number five to our family, but we think of, of the glue that is the consistency of our love and relationship for our kids. We decided to raise Jessica uh, with the experience or within the United Church. I had been at Lawrence Park and have been active there in fundraising. Jill had been active at St. George's. We wanted to try something new and different, not going back to the past, but this was a new us. And we settled upon Fairlawn and we joined the Fairlawn family and we've been a part of it for about 25 years. Well, uh, life did change and John was diagnosed, that is me, was diagnosed uh, with a leaky mitral valve. And it was a candidate for a lesser invasive procedure. Uh, unfortunately, it did not go as advertised. Uh, I became compromi compromised with my oxygen supply in my bloodstream and my optic nerves suffered. I lost my eyesight. I lost my right leg ab above the knee. Life did change, obviously, in the wink of an eye, so to speak. And uh, we uh, had to regroup. I was in the hospital for about seven months uh, in recovering and came home uh, to a different environment. And we had to figure out how Jill and I could carry on uh, my hopefully uh, contributing some resilience along the way, but the consistency that has struck me in time, this is eight years ago, I, I feel with my uh, loss of eyesight and my walker that Jill's right on my right elbow and we scoot around together and that love and kindness of knowing that Jill's there has carried me through. So I just want to touch on staying in love with John, the sort of after the honeymoon, which is much longer <clears throat> than the honeymoon if you're lucky enough and work hard enough. We stayed in love, I think, because we have a lot in common, common history, um, common values. We stayed in love because we have a lot of differences, differences that are both a joy and an incredible challenge at times. Um, and we stayed in love because we uh, work hard at it. Um, and so just a couple of things about us and staying in love, we really have a deep commitment to each other and to our family, it's our number one. But John's been there again through the tough times and that's a lot of what's kept us together, that ability to gather around the difficulties and, and, and work it out. When my son expressed a desire when he was going into grade nine to move to Vancouver to live with his dad and when I blathered more and more and more John was there by my side um, just supporting me and thinking this through supporting Jason through it um, and now we're working on a wonderful cottage project with our family um, going from a sort of one bedroom 600 square foot building to something larger with enough beds for everyone we're putting the they blow up beds and the tents away, at least for a while, so that we will all be able to gather in a cottage. And actually, John and I are in our bunkie right now. It's big enough for us to be here. And um, our whole family is a part of the team. Another uh, situation <clears throat> of joy and challenge, working together in, in a family team to, to bring a dream to reality. And our new life, John mentioned our new life. And Boy, his incredible strength, his drive, his action to live a happy, productive, meaningful life. The expression of love, I think, that we have for each other, and we try to express it every day. Um, some days we don't. As Jill said, it was it can be tough. I call it the intentional hug. This the isn't just a hug. hug. It's with yeah. intention. And mm, I got to say, though, it is not always easy. Never assume that what you see on the surface is exactly the truth. But honestly, uh, we're, we both feel blessed. And um, I love John deeply. I can't imagine uh, anything better. So thanks for letting us share that story, John. The stories we heard this morning so beautifully and honestly shared with us are stories that paint a picture of love grounded in the life experience of the tellers. 
They talk of strength and reliance, survival and sacrifice, delight and struggle. They are a testimony of the heart and its power to sustain our living and color our days with meaning. Love, though, cannot be limited to a form, and we know that. Human love is incredibly varied and diverse and surprising. Just as one couple's story is never the same as another's, and one experience of a deep friendship is in and of itself unique and cannot be copied, so one child is unlike the other. In the end, our experience of love and friendship and companionship are as unique as our DNA, some of it shared, but much of it our own adventure. In this bleakest of winters, in a time when our lives have been stripped bare by lockdown, isolation, and the unknown, love in all its forms from spousal, friendship, familial, to the stranger, these loves have done a lot of heavy lifting to get us through the days and months that we have just gone through. So let us give thanks for the loves we have and the love we give and receive. One of the first things we teach our children about our faith is that our God is a God of love. And to follow our God, we need first to love one another and ourselves. Janet Morley, in All Desires Known, tries the impossible to describe the indescribable love of God. Listen to her words. You held me, and there were no words, and there was no time, and you held me. And there was only wanting, and being held, and being filled with wanting, and I was nothing but letting go, and being held. And there were no words, and there needed to be no words, and there was no terror, only stillness, and I was wanting nothing, and it was fullness, and it was like aching for God, and it was touch and warmth and darkness and no time and no words, and we flowed and I flowed and I was not empty, and I was given up to the dark, and in the darkness I was not lost, and the wanting was like fullness, and I could hardly hold it, and I was held and you were dark and warm and without time and without words, and you held me. We are joined by a double quartet of Fairlawn choristers with a setting of familiar words from 1 Corinthians 13, adapted by Christopher Wordsworth, nephew of the poet, Love is Kind. Love is kind and suffers long. Love is humble, thinks no wrong. Love and death itself most strong. Therefore give us love. Prophecy will fade away. Melting in the light of day. Love will ever with us stay. 
your financial support and participation and involvement and your gifts of volunteer time and energy makes Fairlawn's remarkable journey through this pandemic situation possible. There are many, many ways to give, including by pre-authorized remittance and through dropping off checks in the mailbox at the church or by pressing the donate button on the website. Thank you for the ways that you support our ministry and life together. As always, please let us know if you or someone you're aware of has need for someone to call, to check in, to help out or to provide assistance, an email to me or to the church office, or a call to someone who can do that for you will work well to ensure that someone gets back to you promptly. We've been sharing interviews in recent weeks with members of the Fairlawn Avenue community, telling personal stories and experiences that are rooted in our life together as a faith community. Today, and for the next couple of weeks, we're building on that by saying thank you for the ways we have come together to support new directions and opportunities for ministry right through pandemic time. Good morning. My name is Mary Ellen Richardson, and I am the current chair of Governing Council at Fairlawn. As some of you will remember, we had a stewardship drive in the fall of 2020. We are happy to say that you responded with great generosity, a sign of your ongoing commitment to this church and the work that we are doing. We want to say thank you. Thank you for this, for your commitment, your time, your ideas and encouragement, your notes of appreciation, your financial support. We also want to acknowledge your care for one another and for others, your trust and your ongoing involvement. Over the next three weeks, starting today, one of our purpose ministry leads as spokespeople for many other volunteers We'll talk about what your commitment has allowed us to do and to plan to do. As today is Valentine's Day, it's perhaps no surprise that we are going to hear about how we are working to create a loving, hopeful, and supportive community in our experience belonging ministry. Good morning. My name is Kathy Salisbury, and I'm the chair of Experience Belonging at Fairlawn. It was business as usual at the start of 2020 until we were forced to physically withdraw from one another to curb the spread of COVID-19. This has been a year of working hard to stay socially connected while physically distant. I have always known that Fairlawners care for one another and reach out in times of stress and distress. What I didn't realize is the strength of that impulse. It appears to be part of our DNA. As I reflect on what we have accomplished during this pandemic year, the list is impressive and too long for me to describe fully in the time allowed. Some highlights. Thanks to, jo to Zoom and Joanne's tireless support, we have managed to keep many of our activities going online. Broadview discussion groups and the Tuesday lunch crowd to name a couple, even the basketball group continues to meet weekly for Zoom chats, and I am told that with an average duration of almost 90 minutes, they cover more territory than they ever used to on the basketball court. We even managed to pull off a talent show without coming together physically. The prayer shawl knitters have been busy too. Distributing over 45 shawls to those experiencing challenges, we hear again and again how much they mean to those who receive them. Here's one. Please pass along my absolute delight at the prayer shawl for your wonderful, that your wonderful group gave me. I can't tell you how great it felt to have the shawl with me as I started my chemotherapy. I will treasure your generous gift of love and possibility. 19 post-secondary students received pre-Christmas care packages, a symbol of love and support from our Fairlawn family. One recipient wrote, 
It was just the pick-me-up I needed as the weather gets colder and exams approach. I've already enjoyed the hot chocolate and made use of the mitts. And this from one of the telephone outreach ministry callers. I have found my outreach to be welcomed by all and, in truth, energizing for me too. New friendships have been forged as our team of 34 callers have reached out to 187 households. All of this and much, much more is possible because of your generous gifts of time, talent, and money. Thank you. Thank you. Though current pandemic circumstances will continue to restrict our ability to come together physically, at least in the short term, in the coming months you will see a continuation of many of our beloved offerings online and watch for some new experiences meant to promote wellness and mutual support. To learn more, get involved, or if you have an idea for a way to help us experience belonging even more, contact me Kathy Salisbury, eb at fairlawnavenueunited.ca. And thanks again. And so in these days of continued distancing and isolation measures, vaccine unpredictability, and the need, therefore, to keep our church building closed, to keep everyone safe, this church, Fairlawn Avenue United remains open and full of life and opportunities for community, for connection, and for involvement because of you. Thank you. My name is Douglas Ducharme. Let us pray. I cannot fly, O God of the soaring eagle. I cannot even leap with a dancer's grace. But today I can wake and I can rise, and perhaps the strong wind will remind me not to be so rooted in fear. I cannot measure up, O God of the starry heavens. I cannot even pretend to humble brag. But today I can admire the trees, the sky, the river, and perhaps the stars will teach me to love myself too. I cannot heal. O oh God of the brokenhearted, I cannot even imagine my wounds closing. But today I can sigh and I can sing, so perhaps love will not be powerless in the face of brokenness. I cannot hide, O oh God, beyond measure. I cannot even escape the sun. But today I can meet my own gaze, so perhaps tomorrow I will not mind so much if I am finally found. I cannot fly, dear God. I cannot measure up. I cannot heal. I cannot hide. But I can love and I can be loved. I can learn to accept that love cannot be controlled and that it can be nurtured and that it must be mutual and cannot abuse or lessen the other. And so this day, we celebrate the gift of love, and we acknowledge its diversity and its gift. On this day, we know there are those who are lonely and long for friendship and love. There are those who have not seen family and friends for a year or more, and there are those who grieve the death of someone they loved in a time when they cannot gather as a community to mourn. May we strengthen one another and know ourselves and this world to be held in your love, Holy One. And may we be a blessing one to another. As a child turns to a mother who watches over them, let us turn to God saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. After the service today will be our coffee hour chat. 
where we gather for sharing and um, getting to uh, know what each other has been doing through the week. You are all welcome to that. The link to the coffee chat can be found on our website and in the body um, of the invitation to your worship this morning. And now as we end this service, soften us, O gentle God, soften us. Let the fire of your love thaw the frost within us. Let the light of your justice sear away our blindness. Let the grace of your compassion heal our hardened spirits. O living God, soften us. That flowing with your grace, we will be impelled to face the world in bold compassion. That driven to justice, we may dare to cry aloud for the little ones, the lost, the beaten, the imprisoned, and the hungry. O oh, living God, soften us, sweep us forward in a mighty wave of mercy to heal our hurting world. Go now in peace.